click on manage the mic to come on the stage yeah oh manage the mic click on the manage the mic to come on the stage right if you, you, me, if you can hear me paul you hear me well uh, just click on the manage the mic you know or since you are the moderator you should see like a start the um the event kind of at the back end from your side all right so i think i've uh where's that i click there so i don't know whether you are able to hear me we can hear you clearly but paul couldn't you know he said can you heard me i mean he should be the one to start the uh why don't we follow Frank's advice and get started and then Paul will join. So let me just briefly introduce myself. My name is Sara Brutian. I'm the head of digital innovation at Sustainalytics, which is a Morningstar company specialized on environmental, social, and governance research and ratings. I'm leading the uh, smart technology practice of Sustainalytics with a focus on machine learning, artificial intelligence, information retrieval extraction, and data intensive digital curation. And why don't we gentlemen go in the circle and then address the questions of our uh, our panel discussion in turn. There are three questions, so I'll just hand it over. So I'll get going then. Uh, so my name is James Law, and I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Cybertecture. Uh, we started as a uh, architecture company uh, designing smart buildings and smart cities around the world. <laughs> And we've grown into a company that is um, now designing in the metaverse, dealing with uh, real estate crypto-related projects, and innovating um, you know, our built and virtual environment into one that can merge both uh, real architecture and the new world of uh, empowered cyber living. So uh, that's my background. I'm here based in Hong Kong, and we work internationally, and uh, very, very happy to meet everyone here today. Yeah, welcome, Paul. Hey, Paul. Nice meeting you. Hey, guys. So, okay. Sorry about that. Had some uh, technical issues. I, I was here the whole time. <laughs> hey, Paul. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. Yeah. So, so the game is your, in your hands. Okay. Do uh, you guys want to introduce yourselves one by one? Starting with... We've just started. We just... Yeah, we just... just okay, James. So, maybe we just carry on with the introductions, all right? Sounds good. Hi. Uh, good morning. My name is Sishi there. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably can shortly call me Sishi. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of uh, digital asset management company, Asset Genix, uh, based out of London. So what we're doing is that uh, we were in the process of creating a platform for uh, uh, all crypto exchanges and uh, the crypto asset owners. So they can uh, store uh, their crypto in our platform and uh, it's, it's, what we are claiming is that this is the most uh, error-free and fraud-free platform, which we we, we, we we completed the proof of concept and uh, we just closed our uh, first round of funding. So currently the, the company is based out of London and uh, a consulting opportunity brought me to India, which, I, which is very exciting. I mean, I'm part of a, 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 a mammoth exercise currently going in India, which I would share as we speak. I'm excited to be part of the uh, panel today to uh, to share my thoughts. Sounds good. So I'll probably uh, continue then. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Yamushu. I'm based in Los Angeles right now. Uh, so it's around 6 o'clock my time. Uh, happy Thanksgiving for those of you uh, who celebrate the uh, holiday. Uh, I'm an, uh, I am an entrepreneur, investor, and an active builder and participant of the uh, Web 3.0 era. Um, and I'm also a co-founder at uh, Bella Protocol and ARPA. So a bit about uh, my background and uh, the things that we are building right now. Um, Bella Protocol is essentially an open banking system that in, uh, aims to bring mass adoption to crypto and decentralized finance. We are currently, we have launched our first product suite, which is essentially a decentralized version of an asset manager, which um, gives uh, all the crypto assets about 10 to 20% uh, of annual uh, percentage yield uh, with no impairment loss. And currently we have about $50 million uh, of asset under management. So 
um, I'm going to send you guys a, 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 a link after um, um, our uh, panel uh, so, so that you can uh, you know, learn more about us. And for, uh, so uh, Bella Protocol was actually uh, invested uh, by and incubated by a project called, uh, called ARPA, which I'm also a co-founder of. ARPA focuses on uh, uh, privacy pr preserving computation uh, with the help of blockchain and crypto technology. Um, so besides these two projects, we also have a early stage fund that invests in um, uh, early stage crypto projects. Uh, so far, we have invested in over 30 or so um, projects in crypto, especially including OpenSea, which is uh, one of the uh, most high profile NFT trading platforms uh, around. Um, and so, yeah, that's a bit about me and very uh, very excited to share um, uh, what I know uh, with all of you here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's 3 a.m. here, about 3.30 a.m. <laughs> I'm from, speaking from Lagos, Nigeria. Abiodun Ayurid is my name. I'm, I'm the founder and CEO of Daba Technologies Limited. Um, we started as a startup that consults for um, local authority in Nigeria, and uh, we are involved into um, a, let me say, like, you know, big startup now. And aside that, I lead the fraud and um, detection um, defense in Gitcoin DAO and some other DAOs in the ecosystem, uh, Bankless DAO, I'm, you know, heavily involved in um, uh, in DAO, so I lead some of the research. Um, you know, work with some of them, um, associate professor to do some research in the DAO and uh, um, DeFi blockchain related stuff at large. So I'm glad to be on the panelists this morning. Thank you. Great. I suppose Paul isn't around again, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I think we have three general questions here. So why don't we gentlemen just go through them in turn as a substitute for Paul, if nobody objects. So it's interesting that the first thought here is that the light regulation of digital financial la landscape that some say is a big opportunity and some say is a big landmine, it actually attracts investors, attracts a lot of you know, retail investors. But the question is how we protect personal investors while at the same time continue encouraging innovation in fintech and developing markets. So why don't we start with this? Because there seemingly is a dichotomy here, investor pr protection and at the same time, encouragement of innovation. But I think my informed intuition and probably I see it on your face, it says that there is no dichotomy. So who wants to get started? Well, um, I'll probably start um, and give it a shot. Um, and you, you guys can um, add on to my thoughts. Um, so, you know, um, I have experience in um, several uh, jurisdictions and countries, including the U.S. and, and, and China uh, and Singapore, right? So um, I've been in the space since early 2016. So back then I was w uh, with a company called the uh, Fidelity Investments. Uh, you know, when I heard about the term uh, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. So I, I bought a bunch uh, at, you know, uh, $600 and, and, and in a panic sold um, a, a large portion, if not all of my holdings uh, when it tanked 20% in a day. Um, and that was the uh, worst investment decision that, uh, that I've ever made. I'm sure, you know, uh, we, we all have some uh, very interesting stories in the space investing in the um, asset. But the moral of the story is that, you know, it is a very high volatile and uh, extremely early on uh, and young, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, asset class. So uh, it is very important for people to be educated. Um, and it is very important for all the regulators to catch up with the new knowledge and trend. Uh, and especially the new development uh, in the industry, which is very hard to do because, you know, even being a full-time uh, player and a builder in a space, I feel like, you know, if I don't read on on Twitter and, and, and you know, the Discord and Reddit for like a day, I've, I've been like completely uh, obsolete. And I feel like I'm not like, I, I'm no longer in the industry, you know, all with all the ideas and concepts of DAO, uh, GameFi, uh, DeFi, and like uh, and whole idea of the metaverse, which uh, Jamie is Jam you know uh, building things on, it's it's just crazy for 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 for, for any individual like uh, you know to to uh, to to become an an expert on. So we always joke 
you know, nobody knows about what we are building, and we are all blindfolded uh, until the future, you know, pre pre presents itself. Um, but now, um, I, I think you know, for, from my perspective of view, uh, the regulators in the U.S. are are, are doing a, a a relatively good job in, in catching up. Although, you know, you you, you uh, gentlemen might disagree from your your perspective view, but 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 compared to the Chinese government, you know, which I have like a lot of um, uh, experience with. Uh, that banned crypto, um, uh, and you know, uh, once for all, um, uh, you know, uh, in in the previous tries uh, from three years ago uh, and two years ago in in, in 2019, uh, back in September 2019, you know, uh, all the ICOs were banned, and um, uh, the last year all the OTC trades are banned, and this year. Uh, the, uh, the, the whole asset class is banned essentially. So uh, the normal citizens in China are banned from you know, participating in any activities uh, re regarding trading and exchanging the, uh, the, 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 the asset, which I think personally is a, is a huge unfortunate thing. Uh, but yeah, um, that's a bit uh, of my thoughts. Uh, it's it's, it's, uh, it's uh, quite open-ended, but I'm you know, super excited to hear about, about w w what you guys think. I, I like to add to that. I totally agree with you. I think uh, we're still in a very early stage. And I think um, many jurisdictions around the world, including the general public, we are all kind of struggling a little bit about the stability and the understanding of the whole crypto kind of uh, infrastructure and, and how it can provide a stable platform for us to trade. Um, but there is a, also, from my side, um, a kind of vision to how very quickly I think crypto would become, which is uh, not just the actual cryptocurrencies, but of course now we're talking about NFTs. And in fact, um, you know, some of the projects that we're doing now, which are related to real estate, actually shows that crypto is actually a better way for us to deal with assets. So for example, when we are um, basing our assets on real world uh, commodities like land or or properties, etc. Using the crypto platform as a way to, um, you know, a trade uh, and a way to develop these projects is actually a very, very stable way of dealing with it. Like normally, when we have a piece of land, right, in many jurisdictions, just a piece of paper, it's a land lease. And if you accidentally lose that piece of paper, you actually kind of get yourself into a lot of trouble in terms of ownership. But in the crypto world. In the blockchain, you're secured with your uh, ownership. You're secured with your transactions. And I think, you know, going back to the original question about either the everyday uh, trader, the everyday owner of small assets, uh, in fact, I think crypto provides the opportunity for us when we're linking it to real-world assets, uh, the potential for it to be transacted much more securely, in a much more transparent way, and certainly, I think, in a, in a new uh, strategic way that I think will give us a lot of opportunities to get the best out of our assets. And do we, do we want to go to uh, Shashi? Did oh, you, yeah. You... Uh, I, I, I have a different perspective on, because I've been uh, closely associated uh, with the blockchain uh, uh, area for the last four to five years. I, mean, I, I myself is... A crypto enthusiasts and uh, the, the kind of a thing I noticed is that uh, the, even the so-called regulators are confused with uh, crypto assets with cryptocurrencies. So they fail to understand is that cryptocurrency is a part of a major part obviously is of the crypto assets. So whenever uh, they, they want uh, the, the moment they wanted to think about crypto assets they said cryptocurrencies which is which is which is not true fundamentally so uh, as uh, my co-panelist said the chain of bandit so india wants to ban it so that's, that's that should not be the case i mean this so i mean in fact i, I uh, i'm the part of the uh, a kind of a, a team which has written to the government of india i mean the, there was a, a draft uh, a policy in uh, public domain, which uh, so they invited the comments from the general public. So, uh, so I was one of those few which, which uh, uh, given a, a, a kind of a trying to give a clarity on what need to be banned and what need to be regulated. So, for a countries like uh, Asian countries, mostly like uh, so, the crypto can give huge opportunities. It can create a, 
uh, it is a, it can be a vehicle for job creation. I mean, that is the technologies. So if, if you look at uh, the blockchain, is all pervasive now. I mean, I I, I, I belong to a school of thought. We can't live without a blockchain. I mean, most of these your records are securitized in, for example, the land, is, which is which is massive in Asian countries, and uh, so the, the records are. App- so, for example, I can, I can uh, relate to a, a kind of a real-time stories in India. I mean, the land records in India is more than a century or old, century old, and nobody knows who is the owner of that. I mean, that's 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 really really uh, troubling to anyone. I mean, so, so technology can be used in a proper way uh, rather than a blanket ban without. Yeah, have a, uh, a feeling that uh, the crypto can be regulated, and uh, as you rightly said, the real estate is the biggest beneficiary from blockchain. Because the records can be uh, put it on a uh, securitized platform. So you need to differentiate between w- what is bad and what is good by the regulators. And maybe probably as a as a panelist, maybe probably we can record our uh, views saying that okay so what is good for the uh, the common man and uh, a kind of a this thing, what is bad and what need to be regulated and what need to be bad yeah great and do we do we have a uh, abhi john do we have your uh, feedback on this okay uh away um i share almost the same sentiment um but if we should look at the um, the issue of um, um, crackdown across the um, Asia of recent, you know, if, if we should look at it, we realize that, um, you know, like Asia, I mean, like the world most populous um, continent has seen the enthusiastic crypto adoption, you know, across the region. And if we look at, let's take China, for example, which is like one of the most largest cryptocurrency market. But that's why the official ban of uh, trading, you know, in cryptocurrency in China, uh, as far back as we know it, you know, like, I mean, it's it, it very um, kind of, um, we, we started noticing a lot, a lot of it, especially 2019, you know, trading cryptocurrency has continued online through foreign exchanges, you know, DEX, um, SEX, and, um, you know, DEF using um several AMM stuff like that just to get things done. Um, I would say it is important to be aware that um, digital financial landscape does not offer the same level of money security uh, as a bank. Okay, and um, same thing, you know, with crypto brokers, for example, are not as tightly regulated. We all know that. And if funds are lost, I mean, stolen or anything happened in, on the, you know, in, the, in the space, in the crypto space, they can be lost permanently. So it is vital that um, retail investor, in, you know, investors in cryptocurrency, we, you know, keep abreast, I mean, keep updated with the information on, you know, about cryptocurrency security, and to know that, to know what can go wrong and how to prevent such situations from arising, you know, these are the things that they need to know. But I'm very sure that, um, Either they ban or they do not ban crypto in um, Asia region or China or you know those region. I'm sure they still have a big influence, you know, to to the to the crypto market. So um, we keep to. I, I'm sure they are working on you know the, the 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 other one that they can be using locally, you know, within their own region. But in respect of that, that is more like centralized, you know. But um, I believe the crypto market we can't separate it from china china and asia because they i mean they play a major role in this ecosystem so um i believe that um as things goes on as we get you know more exposure as they see that maybe like uh, there's more um regulation coming in i'm sure probably they will open up yeah okay thank you and Ada, do you, do you have your input in this one I suppose I want to reflect on the uh, on a point that um, Shashitar made a couple of minutes ago. We talk a lot about crypto, right? But the thing is that you know, naturally, when people in the industry very often simply you know uh, not even confused, but they 
In the shadow of crypto, the idea of blockchain or mutually distributed ledger is being lost very often with every non-crypto opportunity that MDL or the blockchain basically offers. And I had a conversation with one of the pioneers in the field. It was a private one, so I won't name him, but a few years ago, you know, out of just the conversation about what what was the first ever blockchain, if you gentlemen look into that from the standpoint of what it allows to do, basically it's a distributed database or distributed records that are being updated instantaneously. We actually came, you know, after a couple of uh, glasses of wine, to the conclusion that the first blockchain was invented by King Henry VIII when he started, when he imposed English language for as a language of bureaucracy and coupled it with the printing press. So anywhere in all that relatively small island, people would be having the same, or bureaucracy would be having the same orders published in the same language. So you could argue that back 500 years ago, you had a mutually distributed database with the records being uh, immutable, and it was a blockchain because every new record would be building on the top of the previous one. So what I'm leading this to is the following. I suppose that the nature of um, MDL actually gives a very interesting insight and a natural outlook into things like non-fungible token, tokens, right? What, what are the use cases that most naturally summon themselves for mutually distributed ledger? These are the cases where we do not want to have or do not trust, or it's infeasible to have a centralized trusted authority. Right? And suddenly when you, one thinks from that perspective, so I went back 500 years now, I'm jumping in into 2021, but I think that the economic effects of blockchain are far much more overreaching than you know, simple cryptocurrencies. And you know, the same non-tangible uh, fungible token story, any kind of other digital asset classes, I suppose within seven to 10 years, the latest, we will be facing huge economy of, no, of digital assets where you know, currencies per se wouldn't necessarily be the prevailing part of that economy. Thank you. And, and James, how, how do you feel about that uh, regarding the tokenization of assets? Currently, mo like as Josh uh, had told us, real estate is uh, gaining a lot of speed. What do you think that's going to do for regulators? How do you think they're going to have to come back and lead you cannot just close the doors on the entire crypto market. It's way too large and it's way too advanced. You know, you, you'll miss out as a nation. What do you think would be next? Sorry, was that a question for me? Re regarding, yes. That okay. was you, Jim. Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, I think in the real estate world, I think there is um, there's a, a very big hunger to innovate the way in which we're doing business. And um, in terms of the regulatory part of it, um, you know, governments are primarily concerned with two things. One is basically, you know, the development and planning of their cities and the land. And the other thing is to be able to generate revenue from that. So from, from private real estate to be able to do that. In both those kind of issues, um, the current way of doing it is very antiquated. You know, there's a lot of uh, human error. There's a lot of subjectivity to it. But um, when we put it uh, into a kind of much more decentralized approach where rules are spread and it's uh, consistent, where transactions can all be audited, etc., then real estate immediately becomes much, much easier as a way to trade, much easier as a way to develop. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, recently, uh, we are working on a project which... Uh, I won't name yet because it will be launched very, very soon, actually in a matter of about a week's time. It will be the world's first project where an entire city is going to be launched based on crypto. So uh, all the land pieces are going to be NFTs. Uh, all the buildings and the apartments, the homes are all going to be NFTs. And in fact, even all of the, you know, the residency uh, access to that real estate is also going to be NFTs. And in the, in the formulation of that project, um, the local authorities, i.e. the government of that country, was very, very bullish about this approach. Because in doing so, um, 
uh, there is a lot less administration to be done. Secondly, because um, of you know currency, fiat currency issues, uh, sometimes it's very difficult for you to be able to make purchases and investments in certain jurisdictions. But in the crypto world, there is no barrier. And then third of all is that um, you're looking for the growth aspects of the real estate, which is basically the, the, the new money, the young money. So the crypto community themselves feeling that if they were to buy real estate, they would want to buy it differently. So all of those things come together to create, I think, a whole new massive opportunity in real estate to become a kind of like a cyber real estate, a kind of cyber approach. And, 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 and even in that itself, mm -hmm. there's a lot of possibilities for very creative approach, for example, in our project, um, because uh, it is actually uh, uh, crypto, because the system is very digitized, people get to choose almost to demark their own piece of land on the site. They can choose the kind of buildings that they want to buy and build on the site. Everything digitized, everything on the blockchain, everything recorded, and I think it's just a much more stable platform. And then the government, they know what's going on. They know that what's being bought, what's being developed fits into their plans, etc. So really a new generation of real estate growing out of the blockchain, growing out of crypto. And uh, Yimu, what's your thoughts on these? Do you think that real estate is, is really the only thing that could be tokenized? Or is there other things, as we're seeing with NFTs, and with some maybe some other industries that you you would see, is, is that a good way to safeguard the, the retail investor and have governments maybe see a, a better version of what cryptocurrency could be? Uh, that's a very good question. So for, first of all, I want to echo what James has said, right? So as um, a, um, I, I mean, I I don't want to say like a, a new generation, right? But like um, you know, my generation of people. Um, uh, being active and being pioneers in the crypto world, uh, personally speaking, I hold 95% of my assets, like overall in cryptocurrency, uh, in the, the digital uh, version. And I, I don't own a house, I don't own a car, right? Um, I, I'd rather own a land, piece of land on Sandbox or like on, <laughs> or, 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 or on uh, crypto Vavoxo or Decentraland. Um, and a lot of uh, people around me share the same mindset, right? So, so, so that is actually happening. Um, and I really echo uh, James's point of view, and you know, f from my experience, so we, um, I, I mean, I mentioned, uh, you know, a bit earlier before uh, that we also do some investments, and we have invested in, in you know, several very interesting projects, including a, a project that's building a financial DAO, um, which enables, uh, you know, any people or, or organization, uh, either uh, with crypto experience or with no crypto experience, with coding experience or with no coding experience. Uh, to build a DAO from the scratch easily with no coding experience uh, in under seven minutes. What that means is that DAO is essentially a new form of um, uh, collaboration, right? Uh, for people around the whole world with uh, little or no friction uh, in terms of um, money transferring or like, uh, 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 you know, the governance. So it actually offers a new way to govern a whole organization without the hassle of like, you know, doing a company registration with lo the local government and, and so on. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you know, the, uh, I believe several of the cities in Wyoming in the U.S. have already started, you know, a, a drastic experiment um, by running their cities uh, on, on DAO. Yeah. So, um, uh, and what that implies for that project that, that I invested in is that um, you can essentially tokenize everything, right? Um, I know that sounds a bit drastic, but for anything from stocks um, uh, to, uh, you know, say, uh, uh, you know, bonds or convertible bonds from financial assets to uh, tangible stuff. Uh, I mean, of course, the it will be more, um, you know, more effective for you to tokenize a, a something that's already virtual or already uh, digital. You know, it, it's the most, you know, natural transition because it, it i think the the, the, uh, the hardest part for you to tokenize a, a a real asset is you know from going off chain to on chain you, you have to trust the human being that's handling this uh, kind of stuff you have to remove that right uh part uh, uh outside the equation for, for for this whole thing to make sense because that's the whole idea of blockchain it's creating a um, machine and code ruled uh world on the base of the internet 
Um, so I think, you know, to answer your question, uh, Paul, um, you, you can virtually in the future tokenize everything, but, you know, th there's got to be uh, with the aid of technology to tokenize the uh, real world assets to uh, uh, the digital assets. But, uh, you know, it, 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 so th this will actually make a lot of sense for you to, to simply tokenize the already virtual or, or already digital assets from financial assets to uh, to non-financial assets. Uh, and it's happening. Right. Um, so so th that'll be my two cents. Speaking of which, uh, Shashida, is, is there something that you want to mention, something you're working on that that you tell us about uh, tokenizing things and making the physical digital? Is, is there something that you think that we but, can have uh, as technologists? So I, I'll carry forward that uh, kind of uh, opinions uh, my co-panelists put forward. So I've been closely working with the government in, in Europe and India. So, uh, so one of the biggest concern uh, the government uh, tells us is that the crypto assets is uh, out of tax net. So my friend has a 95% of his assets in crypto, and which is obviously out of tax net. <laughs> so that's the concern. So the so the the, the, the governments are working on to devise a plan. So they they're looking at a via media. So that the, the crypto assets can be taxed, so that that can be equated with your real-time assets. So this is a long-term process, and it's, it's, the consultation is uh, in, is on, and uh, it's it's not going to happen anytime soon because of the, the kind of uh, the pulls and the push factors uh, of the governments. And on uh, digitization of a uh, uh, kind of even recaps, which, which is. Uh, uh, maybe probably I, I will use a use case which I'm currently in. Uh, uh, what would uh, the, the kind of a blockchain? How is helping the government to create a record? So, so the Indian government is rolling out the biggest uh, uh, vaccination in the world. I mean, it's, they already completed a billion doses, and it's still wow. maybe probably they need to uh, roll out another uh, billion and two billion doses. So the major challenge for India is that this is humanly impossible to. That track this kind of a rollout without the uses of technology. So all said and done, they again the government of India, uh, though they they think uh, blockchain is a big no-no word, but uh, what is helping them to uh, create and protect the data is the blockchain. So so there are a lot of uh, uh, activity happening in that and. Uh, so I share the same, uh, I echo the, the same opinion of my co-panelists. So the technology is, is, to, is to stay here. And even the crypto assets, I mean, we, we can't even think a world which, which is a crypto assets. It's just the current market size is close to three or four trillion dollars. I mean, you can't, the, no government can ignore that kind of a size. So, so we need to devise the policies to protect the retail investors policies to 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 recalibrate the local government uh, laws to, to see that the cryptos or crypto assets can be treated as a real time an asset so so the process is on i mean i'm, I'm very optimistic about uh, we seeing a, a, a stable regulation uh, around the cryptos in the next 3 to 5 years that's my take and how about yourself, Adam? What, what's your take on what's going on with the digitalization of most of these assets? We, we always want to be able to protect the consumer, don't we? I'd like to actually elaborate on the point that all three of my colleagues made. And from, from, the, from the following uh, position, so you see, there's an old Marshall McLuhan argument about technological determinism, you know, that every technology actually in a way determines the type of societal contract or societal construct around that. And if we accept that argument, so let's for the sake of experiment, let's do that, then uh, I'll quote two people who are probably are more well known than Marshall McLuhan. So Peter Thiel and his good old friend, uh, Reid Hoffman had a fantastic talk in University of Stanford. And you know, they represent different, uh, uh, different ends of political spectrum. Thiel is libertarian and, the, uh, and uh, Hoffman is on the, left, uh, on the left side. 
And you know what they agreed on? They agreed that if McLuhan's argument is correct, then the blockchain technology attracts and summons, due to its decentralized nature, anarchist type of societies, while AI or machine learning, for example, due to their, in a way, centralized nature, they actually summon authoritarian or totalitarian uh, structures around them. Let's put politics aside, but from that standpoint, when I was listening to the uh, previous panels, what crossed my mind is, say, James, in that city that you mentioned, I, I just wonder what kind of societal structure would emerge around a city which is, in a way, tokenized and where no bureaucrat can have a full control over records. And, you know, it's the control over information that gives power to bureaucrats, right? And I was born in the former Soviet Union, I know it very well. So, and then there will be a need for very few bureaucrats if you think about that. So I have a question, I don't have an answer, but hopefully we'll all will see the answer in our lifetimes. But if blockchain, and hopefully so, is going to become the dominant technological paradigm of the coming, uh, coming decades, and you know, I truly believe in uh, you know, internet of records, if you will, right? Or internet of value then what type of societal or political setup we're talking about? What will end up? And here I probably should stop. Well, that, that's absolutely amazing. I, I, can I just quickly to reply to you on that? Um, so, you know, my answer is that we don't know about this crypto city, how, how it will turn out. And in fact, that aspect of the project is something that we are treating as a kind of ongoing experiment and ongoing research. But certainly, um, I think there is a movement towards, um, you know, creating digital twins in, in the real life. Uh, and what happens is that the, the digital twin in the, in the so-called metaverse, whatever, will be a, an opportunity for society as individuals and as collectives to be able to openly share and find um, consensus right, in a way that in our real world we can't. I mean, we rely on our politicians, we rely on our institutions to make a lot of those decisions for us. But, you know, we've mentioned a, a lot today in the discussions about DAOs and the ability for us to, you know, create, uh, you know, almost cyber institutions that are completely, you know, in a way truly democratic on a, on a digital level. And I think cities in the future, you know, a lot of the uh, of course, uh, the basic things might be driven by AI, you know, when to sweep the streets, when to, you know, water the plants, etc. <laughs> that will be done by AI. But then on the societal level, you know, some of the, you know, uh, strategic societal level issues will be a combination between AI and a blockchain-based kind of consensus system, which allows people to really express their needs and opinions and then adjudicate it to a certain extent by AI. And I think that, um, I mean, the jury is out. I mean, we, we don't know whether that will work any better than what we are doing for the last, you know, uh, in, in, in the history of mankind where we've relied on kings and emperors and prime ministers and presidents. But I think it's, um, it opens up the opportunity for us to become a kind of collective intelligence that hopefully will have some level of wisdom to it to... Uh, guard our own safety, our mutual health, and then have peace of mind for everybody. So yeah, that's a quick answer to you. It's a, the jury is still out, but I think there's a, a lot of interesting possibilities uh, once the infrastructure is in place. And when the project is public, let us know. Do <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you want to give some input on, on this discussion? Yeah. Um, I just want to complete, like uh, we have a few minutes left now, I just want to complete touch some of the area that was, um, um, you know, um, cause kind of a part of the question that say like how to protect the data while encouraging innovation in the fintech and developing marketing markets and uh, capital markets. So um, I, I just want to touch on that, you know, I have an opinion that like when it comes to cryptocurrency, you know, one of the biggest challenges for um investors is the reality of, of its uh volatility the digital financial phenomenon has quickly risen to a place of um prominence you know in the portfolio of many retail investors especially across the asia region you know in china singapore and the rest you know at the same time analysts 
you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, um, Ara we, we kind of agree with me here. You know, like um, uh, as you know, the analyst has kind of a continue to caution investors, you know, about their uh, volatile nature and unpredictability. Okay, many factors drive price fluctuation, you know, of cryptocurrency, which um, sometimes is always bring issue to blockchain. You know, people trying to uh, when they are clicking on on blockchain, you know, they are trying to use it to um, you know around cryptocurrency. You know, blockchain more about project, cryptocurrency more about spe speculation, right? So. These are the factors that drive price fluctuation of cryptocurrency, and volatility is measured in traditional market simply by you know uh, volatility in index. And then, um, I would say in recent time, in recent time, you know, for for, for me in that I've, you know I've been around DAOs and you know DeFi for some time now. Um, tools for measuring the volatility of cryptocurrency have also become available. You know that uh, people can leverage on, investor can leverage on, and there are many major things to consider when considering crypto investment, you know, from number of years active, you know, supported cryptos, transaction fees, structure, you know, like we have Ethereum, people are shouting, talking about it at home, which, you know, it's, it's not really, the, the, the transaction fees is not making sense, okay? And, um, you know, deposit, maybe the support, deposit withdrawal, you know, method of, of, of cashing out, you know, converting from crypto to fiat, you know, to user reviews and potential liquidity. Liquidity is a key in this ecosystem it had become crucial that we make into um cognizance some of these factors to make better informed um decisions thanks okay and uh, i'm going to go to uh Kashida on this one i'm going to ask what do you think in the current market what do you think is going to be the, the biggest factor in securing a, a retail investor as you see with the u.s they're going with a very slow pace, but they are creating some great uh, gray areas where people can operate and retail investors can take place, but they're not totally shunning it. Do you think that could be an approach that could be worked in, in the Asia region as well at some point? Josh, you there? Uh, I think... Okay. So I think I have yeah. So the major factor. Oh yes, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I got it. So the major uh, the considering factor is this trust of the platform for the real uh, the retail investors. And, uh, if you look at uh, there are more than six thousand or seven thousand uh, exchanges or uh, cryptocurrency platforms. Uh, so many of uh, uh, or maybe probably. Uh, the biggest concern for uh, the retail investor is to choose the platform where to invest. In the sense, so there are only a handful of uh, platforms which which will uh, exist uh, after uh, the government's have a crackdown. And uh, yeah, so as uh, my co-panelist said, the liquidity is one of the biggest concerns. And uh, the, I, I have come across the cases where your investment is lo locked up. In the sense, uh, millions of dollars locked up without um, being used. So, so the, again, so again, when when we talk about the liquidity, it, it, it's, it's a it's a matching. Maybe probably it's it's like any other uh, security markets. I mean, if, if you compare that uh, the cryptocurrencies with the security markets, the, the the biggest advantage of a security market is the liquidity. So you can. You, you you can uh, sell your uh, assets any point in time and um, put them in the liquidity. So uh, it is a, it is a two level uh, uh, issue now. One is the exchanges on the, the the current kind of a players, the private players like us and the government. So we we need to work together and create a a kind of a, a cohesive platform where both can coexist uh, peacefully i mean uh, the government should not come after us and we should be we should not be looking at we should not start our day and uh, wondering what is going to happen by evening so so i i so maybe probably that is the take i have so the trust is which is very very important in this kind of an assets because so nft is is going to grow very big 
and most of the celebrities are putting their uh, uh, the personal uh, stuff on uh, NFTs. I mean, I've seen some of those the film actors in Hollywood and Bollywood, and well, they're raising millions of dollars. That's so the investors need to be protected. And if I if I invested a kind of uh, NFT of a Tom Cruise, I mean, what what is going to happen to me tomorrow? I mean, can I can I leak? Can I have that uh, in liquid form? That's a big question. Yes. You you want to join there? Yeah. Um. I just want to share a set of data with you guys, right? So, like, from so 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 we spotted the opportunity of DeFi in uh in in early 2019, and we're actually one of the um earliest teams in the space. So back back then, um, uh, you know, um, the total value locked or the value or the capital captured by the whole decentralized finance system or the decentralized finance world was only $10 billion, right? And it was $10 billion last year in 2020, um, uh, in November of 2020. And then yesterday I checked, the number is at $107 billion. So that's a a, a, a tenfold growth in that area alone and and it's it's actually mind blowing so for um for the institutional investors and more retail investors to enter the uh, you know to uh, to enter the whole defi or crypto space um you know after the regulation has been cleared um uh, so they enter actually through a form of stablecoin right so stablecoin is essentially uh, uh you know we we can consider this as a one to one pack to a certain you know, fiat currency for, uh, for 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 example uh, us dollars and the issuance of uh of that right of the uh, of the civil coins is is right now around 100 billion dollars and that is growing at a 3% week over week um and back you know a year ago it was around 10 billion dollars so that is also a tenfold of growth so by looking at you know those numbers, we cannot ignore the fast growth in both the asset and the liquidity go uh, you know pouring into the space. And you know the reason behind that, uh, in my opinion, from you know the the, the past two years of uh, you know of uh, of, of uh, observation, is is, is uh, you know in large part due to the uh, interest rate arbitrage opportunities that's. Uh, emerging uh, in the space compared to what we can get in the traditional markets, you know, uh, by de- depositing USD uh, denominated uh, assets into banks, you know, you're you're getting a near zero interest for your asset. But uh, in the world of DeFi, you can actually simply get a five percent to twenty percent APY easily with no impermanent loss or with very l- little risk other than the you know smart contract risk. Um, uh, in the space, so that's what's driving all the smart money, quote unquote, to, pour, to you know to be poured into space. So I do see the possibility and the global uh, you know li- liquidity and the uh, fast uh, growth in uh, in this industry, and I think it's going uh, it's growing even faster if you look at the um, all the government that's you know uh, clearing the uh, regulation uh, for the crypto in, uh, industry, including El Salvador government, which has just made the BTC, uh, or Bitcoin, the legal tender, uh, in their country, right? So as those governments, um, uh, uh, reach a consensus to, uh, to put the all cryptocurrencies and assets into a, uh, more mature legal, um, setting, uh, you know, the, we will see a, a, a much more, uh, a, a much more faster, uh, 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 you know, speed of growth uh, in this industry. Okay, Ada, uh, would you like to add anything to that? We're you know, about the hour, so I wouldn't really want to keep anybody here in the meeting for longer than it. But I think the one over another elephant in the room that probably I hope sometimes we'll be able also to discuss, hopefully also in person, is the. It's a matter of trust, you know, this decentralized uh, commodity, the decentralized asset class. You no, know, or should I say, you know, as a virtual, um, uh, virtual asset, uh, a big part of the value of crypto is based on shared trust of the market participants. And I've been perplexed when I've been looking into how little the issue of trust is being, is being approached or tackled, you know. Probably people in this group take trust as given, you know, because we are in this in the sector. We know it from inside to to this extent. 
but uh, you know i'm representing xgen right xgen created the internet but they will never be as good in that as let's say the millennials or the other guys coming through so uh, i think when the, with xgen there is a big problem of having um of understanding why uh you know what would be the source of trust into cryptos like so yeah well, you've had 95 percent of your assets and i think it's completely normal for you you know for me as an outlier for my generation but probably not for the big bigger part of my generation and we should probably be trying to act as the ambassadors for in a way for the future you know because for me, it's so clear. It's decentralized, and it's in a way based on the mutual distrust. You know, the whole idea of a crypto is based on the mutual checks and balances. I trust it, right? But that's a message that should probably be better explained to many, you know, retail investors. I mean, looking to even institutional investors. How long it uh, took the uh, took Bitcoin to come to the radar of the banks from 2009 to 2014, 15, right? I mean, let, let's not get into the fact which kind of what kind of people control the banks, you know, or are in the C suite positions. But you get the point, right? So the message of trust needs to be probably uh, better articulated. James, do you want to add a uh, finishing statement to that? Yeah, I, actually, I love this last part of this discussion. I, I think this issue about trust. I think, I think one of the greatest, um, you know, evolutions now. Uh, human consciousness will be at this moment when uh, society is able to evolve its interpretation of trust from one which is of the physical world into one which is of the crypto world. And I think um, our definition of trust needs to be almost rewritten. Um, you know, innately, you know, we, we were a physical species. If we hold something in our hand, we own it, we can stop other people from taking it. And therefore, we can start to build a platform of trust. This is mine. This is yours, etc. But uh, you know, now this whole new, uh, I think, reprogramming of trust is entirely based on a different DNA. I mean, it's almost like a, um, it's like a co-shared trust. You know, look, you know, if I'm going to tell a lie to one of you, but the other, all of the other panelists knows I'm telling a lie is in fact already a structure of trust because, you know, we are all open to that uh, narrative. And I think um, the new technologies that are available to us, in fact, rewrites our governance in that way, in that uh, we don't need to be uh, necessarily in possession of anything in order to have trust, but in the fact that we share everything, then we have trust. And um, I think that kind of dichotomy of thought is something that is of course, very difficult for different generations of people to see, um, especially you know, with your hard-earned, lifelong assets and wealth. You know, are you willing to, you know, put it from there to here? Um, but um, you know, I think one of the things that will make it easier eventually is uh, once crypto, uh, and I think it will be very quick that it will reach a state of stability. I mean, there's a lot of volatility at the moment, which gives a lot of fear to people. I think once it reaches a level of uh, stability, uh, which might come from a combination of, of course, like as we were saying, like in terms of its liquidity, in terms of the number of people who actually hold the assets, you know, when it reaches a kind of that tipping point, that critical mass, I think then it's almost become second nature, right? You know, if we trust the bank, we can trust the blockchain. So it's uh, it's it actually just gets over that little kind of you know, target line of volatility. And I think then uh, it's not any matter about whether we understand the trust. We just take it, uh, you know, as, a, as, a, as an instinct. So that's my, that's my opinion. Okay, great. And, uh, totally agreed. We're going to end this here. Is there anything else that you guys want to add? Final statements? I think question. the final statement is it's been a great panel. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Have a cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Bye.